We've seen what happens in the lagoon. How about the reef and the edge of that system? Well, in the edge of that system, we can typically find grain shoals and TP pizzolit belts. What is a TP pizzolit belt? Well, here's an, an example actually of uh, pizzolit or in this case, onchoid. Those are coated grains, but you can see that unlike Ooids, they're not regular, they're very irregular. You can see all the undulation there. It is thought that these are actually deposited by the mediation from blue-green algae, an algae that requires light to grow. And again, an algae that does better in high salinity because of the, the absence of grazer. So less competition for that, uh, for that algae. And we have tons of that in this system here in the Permian Basin. In fact, it's really interesting because this system also forms a very strange structure known as a tipi structure. So you can see here, we have a person for scale. We have the base of the tipi is a flat uh, bed. The top of the tipi, if you look carefully, the next bed on top here that is just about eroded would be flat on top as well. So we have flat bedding in both cases, which indicates that this growth structure was here during deposition. And we kind of wonder, you know, what creates this, this uh, mounded structure? Why do we have this mounded structure? And if you look closely, what we see is a lot of cement. So we have a lot of cement being deposited. It's aragonite or calcite cement, which indicates supersaturation, probably because of high aridity. So you concentrate these elements. And the growth of that cement effectively is pushing on the carbonate. So you have expansion of the cement that expands the, the sediment and forces it to form those TP structure at time of deposition. And eventually these TP structure are filled, it creates accommodation that is eventually filled. So the TP structure is sealed. And this is something you only see in arid system and is very characteristic of the Permian in uh, this uh, particular basin. Now, as we get close to the shoal, we also find a lot of skeletal grain stones. And these particular grains, you can see they're about you know, one centimeter long. They're actually a benthic foraminifer from Permian age. This benthic foraminifer is a fusilinid. And those fusilinid, those large benthic foraminifers are effectively um, autotrophs. So they need, they need light to grow. So that is an indication that these sands were deposited in very shallow water, probably 10 meter, 20 meter of water depth. They're very clean, so that indicate again that there was a lot of wave agitation, so it all makes sense. And well, this is char characteristic for the Permian Basin. So what's interesting is if you look at a depositional model for this uh, system, what we've seen so far, we went from the better gypsum and sandstone to the more paleoidal mudstone and waxstone to more grainy deposit where we saw pizzolid, packstone structure, you know, where we had those, those interesting um, TP structure. And now we are in bioclastic grainstone. And all of this is really shallow. And you might wonder where the reef is. And we've talked about this in previous classes. But what's really important to realize is that in this system, the reef is actually deeper than the rest of the sediment. It's not a shallow reef. And so really those, those uh, large benthic foraminifers are the shallowest part of the system. They are where the, you would expect a reef in the modern world, whereas the reef is much deeper because the reef is made of sponges and bryozoans. So we have more water depth at the reef, anywhere between 30 meters to 80 meters, depending on what system you're looking. Whereas those bioclastic grainstone maybe were deposited in 20 meter of water depth or less. And again, we've seen this in, in our previous class, but that explains a lot the geometry of the Permian Basin because the reef is deeper than the back reef. And as a reminder, it's important to realize that you cannot not always use the modern reef as a analog for the past. So again, we've seen previously that the Devonian and the Permian were probably different and the geometries were, were governed by different rules or slightly different rules. Physics is still physics, 
but biology evolves in different ways and the reef was able to grow in much deeper environments. So let's look at this reef now. This reef is characteristic in the Permian Basin by two different types of assemblages. The first assemblage is a platy sponge community associated with uh, bryozoan. So now in this case, the platy sponge community forms the backbone, the framework of the reef. And these are giants, uh, giant uh, sponges. They're about two meters across. I'm showing you a piece of one here, but imagine that this sponge here would be two meter across. So very, very big um, sponge. And we can see here that we have bryozoan dangling from the sponge. That's one part of the reef. Here's another example of the same reef with a, a smaller but very clearly visible sponge. This um, is a beautiful location, very close from the entrance to the uh, Carlsbad Cavern National Park if you ever go and visit this part of the world. Now, the other type of uh, reef that we find in this system is one where the framework builders are actually from those bryozoans and the sponges dangle from the reef. So here's a, an example of a bryozoan. So that's a bryozoan in the Permian Basin. So this one we see very nicely. That's why I'm showing it to you. But here's how it looks also at uh, the outcrop. So the bryozoan is barely visible here. It forms the edge of a cavity that is now filled with sediment. And within that cavity, you can clearly see one sponge that is attached to the wall of that cavity and grows into the cavity. So two different types of uh, reefs here. So the ecology changes through time, even during the Permian. But the point is, neither sponges nor bryozoans are autotrophs. They're heterotrophs, they're filtering organisms. They actually don't need light to grow. And the, what they do is they build a reef that has a similar function than modern reef. It breaks the wave action but it can also withstand much deeper water because it, it needs to be close to wave action for the water to circulate so that it can basically receive the nutrients that those filtering organisms need, but it doesn't need to be that close from the area of light penetration. That's why it can grow much deeper. So again, be careful, ecology matters for carbonates. Okay, so now we can look at what happens on the slope of that system during the high stand. And we have beautiful geometries preserved, like I said. Here you can see that the carbonate of the high stand are mixed with the clastic of the low stand, and the angle of the slope is preserved. And if you look closely at this slope, you can find evidence of slumping. This is a beautiful slump here that is highlighted by the, the silica. We have uh, some uh, silica sometimes preserved in these, uh, in these settings. And we can also even see some evidence for transported larger grains, so mass transport deposits, turbidites, etc.